In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let me start by saying that it's nice to be back in this pulpit. For those who are not worshiping in person with us, we've been making a few adjustments in the church, and we now have freed up the pulpit and the lectern, which, from my perspective, is fantastic. On that note, I hope you will join us at some point in the near future, if you're able to, for an in-person worship. Anyway, onward to the sermon from the pulpit. On three separate occasions in the Gospel according to St. Mark, Jesus offers a prediction of his passion to his disciples. Now today, I'd like to look briefly at all three of these because I think that doing so will help each of us to understand the gospel according to St. Mark a little bit better and also offer us a little bit of a roadmap about how we are called by Jesus to live as Christians and follow him. The first passion prediction is in today's gospel, Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. It's pretty easy to see how this scene can be broken into three parts. Part one, on the road to Caesarea Philippi, Jesus predicts his passion, death, and resurrection. Part two, St. Peter, not yet St. Peter, but Peter responds to Jesus by taking him aside and rebuking him. Part three, Jesus teaches his disciples and the gathered crowds a little bit about what true discipleship is. Someone who denies themselves and takes up their cross and follows Jesus. Now, the second passion prediction takes place in the next chapter of Mark's gospel. Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 38. And this second prediction follows a nearly identical three-part pattern. Part 1. On the road to Capernaum in Galilee, Jesus predicts his passion, death, and resurrection for a second time. Part 2. His disciples do not understand what he is saying, and they are afraid to ask, but they begin to argue with one another about which one of them is the greatest. Part three, Jesus teaches his disciples again about true discipleship, explaining that the last must be first, and taking a little child into his arms and explaining that whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. The third passion prediction takes place yet another chapter later in Mark chapter 10, verses 32 through 45. And it also follows the same pattern. Part one, on the road to Jerusalem, we're nearing the end of the gospel, Jesus predicts his passion, death, and resurrection for a third and final time, noting that these things will happen when they get to Jerusalem. Part two, two of his disciples, James and John, respond by asking if they can sit at his left and on his right when he is glorified. Jesus explains that they don't know what they are asking. And then the other disciples get angry with James and John for asking at all. Part three, Jesus teaches his disciples yet again about true discipleship, explaining that they are not to be like the Gentiles who lord it over one another, whose greatest are tyrants. But he says, whoever wishes to become great among you must be a servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, 
but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, in short, each passion prediction follows the exact same basic pattern. Part one, Jesus predicts that he'll be handed over, suffer, die, and rise again. Part two, the disciples fail to understand what Jesus means and end up coming across, shall we say, poorly. Part three, Jesus uses the disciples' flawed responses to teach them about true discipleship, which is service to each other and treating the least among them as the most important. One of the big questions, if not the big question in Christianity, is why does Jesus have to suffer and die? I suppose there are many valid answers to this question, and certainly theologians and writers have spent lots of ink trying to fill in uh, the gaps and what that answer might be. But I think an answer that we can discern from Jesus' own predictions of his passion is that he suffered and died, quote, because the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Let me repeat that. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Serving others, giving our lives, not just a few hours here and there, not just some small percentage of our resources, but our whole lives, from start to finish and everything in between. That is what it means to be truly Christ-like and therefore truly Christian. Most, maybe all of us, struggle with that. I certainly do. It's the same high bar that Jesus gives when he instructs us to be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. The same high bar that Jesus gives when he encounters the rich man who has observed all of the commandments and simply wants to know what more he needs to do to inherit eternal life. And you remember what Jesus says to him. You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. It's a pretty high bar. Would you prefer a lower bar? Would you prefer a faith that required less of you? I call those hobbies. What Jesus offers is not a hobby. He offers a life, seeking God and striving to get closer to the high bar of perfect service complete charity, and life-giving sacrifice of ourselves for others. Of ourselves and everything we have for others. And I think we all know that deep down, that that's what the bar is. Maybe like those first disciples we claim not to understand. Or we try to make a case that it, there must be another way. Or maybe we even try to shift the paradigm a little bit, just enough so that we get what we want. Or as Burger King used to say, we get to have it our way. But deep down, I think we know where the bar really is. And we know we are following Jesus of Nazareth, who endured great suffering and was rejected by his people's elders chief priests and scribes, all of the leaders, the elders, the holy people, and the most wise of all of his people rejected him. Jesus of Nazareth, who was then killed and who rose again three days later. Now, that's who we're following. This Lent, I hope you will join me in praying about how each one of us can more fully live into the path that Jesus has asked us to walk with him when he says, 
If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.